We're going to do finite element, continue on that, right, today. And I told you this week what we're going to do is show you the PD toolbox. But sort of in some sense, before we get uh, going too far along, I want to provide sort of the framework of what we want to do as a motivating example on Wednesday and Friday, okay? And this is uh, for those of you in AA, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's right up your alley, okay? And I'm going to basically touch just demonstrate a very simple problem that actually requires quite a bit of sophistication to solve mathematically, okay? So we're going to set up a problem. Here it is. Three dimensions. Okay? All right. X and, and Y and Z. And we're going to put a fluid in there. And the fluid components are going to be U, V, W. So that's the, that's a nice Y, isn't it? Let's try to make that a nicer Y. Okay. V and W, these are the velocity components of the fluid. Okay. So I might have a velocity vector uh, that looks like this, U, V, W. All right. Now this will look familiar to you because we've kind of already looked at something like this before. There's a box of fluid, and I should probably have a, another corner back here somewhere. Something like that. Okay? And I'm interested in understanding the fluid flow in this box. In particular, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to think about not what we did before, which we were before we were looking at we were looking at sort of what happens to this fluid if, if this height here was very shallow in relationship to this spatial distance. Now instead, we're going to start thinking about flying an airplane through this thing. Ready? Get your 3D goggles on. Okay? It's super easy for people at home to have them on in their pajamas right now. Okay? Uh, all right, here's a wing cutting right into my 3D fluid. <laughs> nice. You could totally fly with this thing. <coughs> there's our pilot waving hello. <coughs> all right, so the wing comes through the fluid. <laughs> and we can start taking a look at the cross-section of this plane wing, right, which is, it has some cross-sectional profile, something like this, into the fluid. And admittedly, it's not a very good drawing, but <coughs> fine, we'll just keep going with it. And the idea is, right, that you have some fluid flow this way, and the fluid flow goes over the wing and goes underneath the wing. And what we would like to understand is the fluid flow around that wing, okay? So at least it's a good enough picture to get you the concept, right? Even if the thing won't fly. Uh, and we're going to have a couple length scales here that are going to be important to consider. One, sort of that width of that wing, okay? And two, the length of that wing. And we're going to assume in this is that we're going to make a parameter, call it delta, which is the width of the wing much smaller than the length of the wing. Now, why do we want to do this? Part of why we want to do this, at least initially, is that we want the separation of scales. <coughs> so you can imagine if it's very long, if I'm in the middle here somewhere, the fluid flow sort of looks quasi-two-dimensional. I don't want to get into a full 3D flow yet. I just want to understand if I think about this being a really long wing, an infinitely long wing, okay, then all I have to think about is 2D flow over that wing. And maybe the first thing I can do is start answering basic questions like, hey, uh, can I design a right, really nice wing by this method? Can I figure out what's the geometry of that wing shape so that I can, in fact, for instance, 
suppress as best as possible turbulent flow on the back end for certain speeds. <coughs> An airplane is actually uh, much more complicated, but this is the basic structure that you think about. Yeah. So Uh, good question. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure I can answer your question. Let me answer your question. No, okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, actually. That's a good question. Hey, hey people, want to throw something in there? No, the room is silent. Uh, well, let's put it this way. If you were designing an airplane in the back in the 50s and 60s, you would have done this. <coughs> you would have not had the computational resources available to you to do the 3D problem. So you would have said right away, I can't even solve the 3D problem. How about I assume it's true and work from there? Yeah. See what happens. Start getting some design criteria. OK? So part of what we want to do is address this problem. How do I think about setting it up? And notice the most important thing here. The most important thing here is I have a very, if, if I look at this plane now, OK? If I, take a cutaway view of this thing. I have a fairly simple domain. And then what I have in here is this wing shape. And fluid does not flow through it. You certainly hope fluid does not flow through that wing. Okay. When you're on a plane, you hope it goes around this wing, and then it provides some kind of lift and keeps you nice safely up in the air. But from a math point of view, here's the issue we want to address. All of a sudden, that thing being in there creates all kinds of problems for us. Because think about boundary conditions you have to impose. And now, right in the middle of your domain, sitting there is boundary conditions on potentially a complicated geometry. Okay, so you want to understand. I have the flow field, and I let's write down some equations for it in a minute. It's coming past here, and I want to understand what can go on past this wing. With that in mind, actually, let's just go skip to this real quick. I'll show you some cool pictures. All right, that's on. So. What happens under a flow field like this? Well, I'm going to show you some stuff. I'm not going to, I'm going to do a much simpler example, actually, here. Uh, I'm going to just show you what happens if you had a cylindrical wing, which I don't think is recommended for flying. But you can, you'll be able to see some of the behavior here. OK. I yeah, just had it on. Everybody can attest to the fact that this thing was just working a minute ago. Okay. Don't worry. We'll get it worked out. Nate Dog's in the house working the machine. There we go. Something did it. Something. No? I found out if you turn it all the way off, it's back on again. The machine? Computer? Yeah. Okay. All right, ready? Ready? Here we go. And back on. It's not even what I did before. I just plugged it in before. Tell you what. Did you do a hard power down? No. I didn't even have to do that. No. It just worked. Hold on. Now that one works. Okay, now we go to annotate PDF. This one. There we go. No, wait. Don't worry, Will. I got it covered. Last time, all I did was flip a page. There we go. Let's flip back a page. OK. See that, Will? I'm working it. I'm magical, Will. All right. <coughs> Actually, you could do the lights down in front. OK. Here is a cylinder immersed in a fluid where the fluid is moving from left to right. And I've given you four frames. What are the different frames? Basically, as you increase the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is related to the velocity of the fluid. Okay? But why don't you say, well, why not just say the velocity of the fluid? Because it depends a lot on what the fluid is. Okay? 
if you move honey at 700 miles an hour, it's amazing. <laughs> okay? If you move water at 700 miles an hour, less amazing. Air at 700 miles, less amazing. Okay? So you could have very, uh, you know, create shocks in honey at a much lower speed than in air, for instance. Okay. So, <coughs> in some sense, if we had a fluid and we increased the speed of that fluid, here's what the behaviors you would see. So first of all, this is what's called just steady state flow around the cylinder. You can see the flow is slow enough, it just kind of comes around the cylinder very nicely. Pinch, you know, it's almost, if you look very far away from it at any direction, it's almost like this thing wasn't even there. It just sort of goes around it, okay? You increase the Reynolds number and you start seeing something happen. There's an instability in the flow and now this thing can't just come around, it's too fast it, and it starts to curl around. It creates these little vortex pair that just gets trapped right in the back of this thing. Okay, So the fluid comes around and it just creates this little eddy that sits right behind here. Now, if you've been out and you've been like fishing or something, I don't know, anybody fish? Anybody fish? Yes, okay, like if you're like in a stream in a brook and it's so nice and peaceful and you hear music, like Bambi music, doo -doo -doo. Anyway, if you have a rock in the stream, sometimes you'll see this, right? Stuff goes around it, a little curl here. In fact, kayakers use it to go rest right there. White rapids around a rock. Right around the rock, you have this nice little stable point. That you could just rest there for a bit, okay? Increase the fluid some more. Then you get this awesome structure here where these vortices get shed off, okay? These are... Uh, von Karman uh, vortex shedding is what it's called. And you could just see it's a very nice, beautiful behavior, right? You just get these pairs of vortices being spun off the back of this thing for that Reynolds number range. And then finally, you go so high and this thing here just becomes a mess. Okay? It's fully developed turbulence on the back end of this thing. Okay? And this is kind of a drag. Thank you for giving me the, oh, it's an awful joke. I know, but listen, that's exactly what you're trying to suppress if you're going to high Reynolds number. This will cause you to burn a lot of extra fuel if this is what's happening behind your wing, okay? So part of what you'd like to do is figure out, can I design this differently to stop this, okay? So these are the kind of uh, behaviors you get in two dimensions, off a cylinder. And remember, so the, the idea here is that I have the cylinder in a fluid, and they just basically run fluid through it, and they try to keep it as 2D as possible. Okay? However, you could go to 3D. And for instance, uh, can you guys see that okay? I can't, it's hard to move it around on my screen. But there you go, there is the attempt at a 3D ball. Okay? So there's, you've got to put it on there so it's like a lollipop, right? You've got your little stick in it, and you can see the stuff comes around the edge. And you can imagine the same th stuff's going to happen, which is when you come around, if it's 3D, you'd come around this thing and connect and keep going. And then, but it has much more complicated behavior in, in 3D than it does in 2D, actually. And you'd like to understand this, okay? But this here plays a huge role in the dynamics of what you're going to see, okay? And that is simply a very simple domain with a boundary inside of it. Okay, so part of what we want to do is set up a description a little bit. Now, what we're going to do here and with the PD toolbox is just primarily work in this regime. Okay, however, PD tool can box can actually do a little bit more sophisticated things, but we'll just stay with here for now, just so you get an idea of implementation setup and how to actually apply this. Okay, anything on that? Questions? I think that's all the pictures I have for today. So um, that was the exciting part of the show. Now we go back to real work. All right. Let me turn off this. So, okay. So.